Another black man killed by cops, followed by protests all across the country. Join Richard Ebeling and me in this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle as we examine the killing of George Floyd. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you every week the principal case for libertarianism in the context of the burning issues of our time. I'm joined, as I am every week, by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to be with you and our viewers and listeners. Yeah, lots going on, Richard. In the midst of this coronavirus crisis, you and I touched on this last week. It was just getting, the, the, the pot was just starting to simmer, but now it's gone to a full-blown boil with the, uh, the cop killing of, of the black man George Floyd and, uh, Floyd, and then um, the massive protests in response to that, and then the crackdown on the protests, and then the looting that took place as part of the protests. So I thought, well, this is a good time to discuss one of these burning issues of our time, which is what's going on right now. And it seems to me that we've got three major issues that are going on here. One is the cop killing of, of, of Floyd. I mean, it, it's, this is going on across society. You know, I understand that, that cops kill people of all colors. They, they, they've taken this master-servant uh, mindset where they're in charge, they can essentially do whatever they want. The Supreme Court has enabled them to do this with, with a doctrine called qualified immunity that essentially just gives cops a license to do whatever they want to people. But there does seem to be this, this, this spate of, of bigotry against blacks uh, in terms of killings as of late. I mean, you've got just time after time after time where the cops are just exercising extreme brutality and in many cases getting away with it, uh, where prosecutors uh, are reluctant to, to prosecute because these are their buddies that help them get drug convictions and they look at it as like as a betrayal if they, if they prosecute a cop for the murder or manslaughter of a person. But here it was like, boy, the uprising was so large that it was clear they couldn't get away with it. I mean, you had demonstrations all across the country. So that's the second issue that arises. So you, you first got the, the problem of the cops killing blacks and others, and then you've got the issue of the protests, which, of course, is a fundamental God-given right. It pre-exists government. Uh, the First Amendment enshrines that right in terms of the right to peaceably assemble and protest. And so you've got that taking place, but in the context of this, you've then got the looters that the small segment of people that take advantage of the protests to go in there and start breaking into stores and retail establishments and stealing things, uh, which, which obviously contradicts the principles of a free society, a private property order, the principles of libertarianism. And then you've got the cops that in turn are retaliating, not just against the looters, which of course would be legitimate in terms of bringing people to justice for breaking into people's stores and stealing things, but you've got them also now exercising brute force in many instances against the demonstrators themselves. I mean, just a total ignoring, uh, ignoring of, the, of the First Amendment where you have just massive brutality taking place, including against the press where you have people saying, I'm press, I'm press, and they don't care. They kick them or they shoot, shoot them with pepper spray or whatever. Um, so you've got those three issues taking place here in, in American society, and, and I think most of the demonstrations are peaceful, uh, but you've got the cops exercising brutal methods to shut them down, and then you've got the President of the United States that's stoking the flames here uh, to a large extent, uh, talking about essentially declaring martial law, bringing in the troops. And as I wrote in a recent article, that, that uh, this, we, we may very well see why our ancestors were so opposed to these standing military establishments, the Pentagon, the military industrial complex, uh, the, whole, the whole huge 1.2 million man permanent standing army that we have in this country that 
that the framers and our American ancestors would never have countenanced because it's such a danger to a free society. And of course, President Eisenhower alluded to this in his farewell address where he said this, this apparatus that the United States had become after World War II posed a grave threat to the liberties of the American people and the democratic processes. And so Trump is now saying that he's thinking about using this army against the protesters and the demonstrators. Um, and we, of course, you know, we've seen this in other countries like in Tiananmen Square where troops obeyed, loyally obeyed orders to, to slam down demonstrators there. And uh, so it would be certainly a huge thing if that were to take place in the United States. But that's what Eisenhower warned us about. That's what our founding fathers warned us about. That was why America was founded as a limited government republic uh, with just a basic military force so that it could not pose this kind of a threat. Uh, because our ancestors understood that, that a giant military establishment is, is probably your biggest threat to liberty. Now, I, I wrote an article today uh, on my blog post for the Future of Freedom Foundation where I talked about the drug war. And here is where I think you, you, the root, a root of the problem is that you, you've had these drug laws for years where people can... Um, where cops can essentially exercise racial bigotry with, with a license to do so and get praised and thanked for their service, where you, they're enforcing the drug war. They're trying to rid America of, of drugs and make sure children don't get drugs. And so cops have essentially had a license to arbitrarily stop any black they want, um, no warrant, no, no real judicial order, uh, humiliate them with pat-down searches or hit them with crimes like driving while black or living while black or uh, violent raids on their homes, vi uh, violent raids that have often turned into death, uh, demeaning interrogations. And then, of course, there's the frame-ups uh, where cops plant drugs on blacks driving down the highway. They seize their assets. A uh, famous case was the case of Talia, Texas, where a white decorated police officer just made up an entire story of a large number of blacks, dozens of blacks there that were supposedly involved in drug distribution and got sent up to long terms in the penitentiary, and it was later proven that he had made the whole thing up. Um, well, the, the drug war gives them that opportunity. The drug war serves as a magnet for, for bigots in society to go there because in the private sector, you know, the bigot's going to get socially ostracized. He's going to get uh, maybe fired from his job when the employer figures it out. Uh, or his retail establishment's not going to get, uh, he's going to lose market share. So the private sector provides methods by which you can deal with racial bigotry by making them pay a social or economic penalty. But you've got police departments that are serving as magnets for racial bigots. Now, I'm not saying that every police is a bigot. We, we know that, just like every judge is not a bigot. But there are bigoted cops. We know that. And with, with this drug war, they have... It serves as a magnet to draw the bigots in society to their to that sector because they can get away with it. They can go in there and just exercise their bigotry to their heart's content and get praised and glorified and thanked for their service. I think that so. I think that a major first step in resolving this problem of racial bigotry among the cops is just legalize drugs, because then you deprive these bigots that are in the police department from having this opportunity. And then, then they'll start drifting away back into the private sector once they realize that the police department doesn't serve their needs anymore. And then they're subject to the same standard uh, societal norms on, on correct behavior where people can boycott them and socially ostracize them and so forth. So let me wrap this up by saying that I think that would be a perfect first step to ending the, the bigotry within the police departments. Just get rid of this drug war. Uh, I mean, it's, there's no purpose for it anyway. It's just immoral, destructive, deadly, corrupt. And then uh, restore this sense of, of the importance of free speech and protests and so forth. And then restore the, the, the sovereignty of the individual over the cops. See, the cops think right now that they're the sovereign, that they're the bosses, and that we're their subjects. And that, that mindset has to be turned upside down where the American people make it clear that no we're in charge here we're the masters and you people are the servants you're not going to smash down uh, protests and so forth and if you do you're going to be held to account for it and then get rid of this qualified immunity 
uh, doctrine where if cops do violate people's rights, they're subject to getting sued and develop this culture of criminal prosecution against cops that um, kill people uh, wrongfully or manslaughter and so forth. What do you think, Richard? Well, uh, let me start off with just sort of reinforcing some of the things you've said, and then I'd like to add a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, anyone who's had a chance and tens of thousands have to see this video of George Floyd down on the ground his ha hands already in handcuffs behind his back uh, with this policeman with his knee on his throat. And after a few minutes, uh, Floyd is saying, I can't breathe, and you know, basically begging to, to be allowed to grasp, gasp for air. And the guy basically suffocates him to death. And that's how the autopsies have now shown it. The two autopsies have been done. Uh, th this is just horrendous. Forget whether the, the, the George Floyd was black, white, Asian, pink, purple, orange, whatever. This is a degree of misuse and abuse of police power that is so egregious, particularly when it is there on video for each and every one of us around the world to watch, that the, the, the most important thing was that this policeman, to be stripped of his legitimized use of force, and to then be arrested and charged with murder, because th th there's no doubt about this. You know, I, yes, he's innocent until proven guilty, the court procedure there, but as someone who is a citizen and is allowed to make his own personal judgments uh, concerning things with realizing that the due process of law is there in the court, the guy killed them, and that's the end of the story, in my humble opinion, that, that, that this cannot be tolerated in in, in a free society. Uh, the, the, and and the, therefore, you have to get at sort of the, the underlying rationales that permit such behavior. A crucial one is what you brought out a moment ago, and that is the way the system is institutionally set up. Too many officers of the law who are allowed to be armed and to use their arms with, in principle, up to lethal force believe that they are masters as opposed to uh, servants. Uh, this is reinforced by this partial immunity, which you refer to, this capacity of police to do things without being subject to being criminally or civilly sued uh, the same way you or I could be if we perform such equivalent act uh, in, in relation to others in society. Uh, now, this has been judged before by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has to redo their decision. That, that, that's a bottom line on that. Uh, you, you cannot allow a person who has the legitimized right to use armed and physical force against the rest of the citizenry to have any special privileges or immunities that exempt them. If you do that, we are no longer a, a, a system that has a rule of law, but of, a rule of men. It has been understood, going back to English law, that what it means to refer to the rule of law is that all are equal and accountable, all the way up to the king and the servants of the king. In their behavior, they cannot be viewed as a privileged class. So that, that, that is absolutely essential. Then there's a wider mentality of the ability of abuse that has to be challenged and overturned. One example of this is asked forfeiture. This idea that on a suspicion, without any documentation or proof or presentation of evidence in a court of law, the policing authorities can come and garnish your wealth, seize your house, take your car, take your boat, take anything that is your personal property under the presumption and assertion that this has something has to has this has somehow had something to do with let's say drug dealing. And then you, rather than being presumed innocent until proven guilty, are taken to be the guilty party, and you have to presume you have to present evidence that you are innocent through a long and prolonged and difficult and labyrinth of legal procedures. At the end of which, which will have cost you a lot with your attorney fees, you may be found to be innocent, but even in that, you may not get back all of your money or your personal property at the end of the day. 
and and police departments around the country have viewed this as 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 a cash cow for 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 the costs and costs and expenses and largesse of their own departments to get the perks of cars that then can maybe be distributed to a local police chief or sold off at auction for money for the department for 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 other things and we have to challenge this militarization of police departments where 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 surplus military equipment is sold to local police departments they have tanks and bazookas and god knows what now if 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 the, if a kid is given a new toy what does a kid like to do with the new toy he wants to play with it until he gets bored and can get a new toy to play with again this has to police are not the military and we are in a society in which it is virtually un for local police departments to have that kind of foul firepower and to then be trained in it as if they are a military force to be using against the domestic citizenry. Those have to be changed. There has to be, in this most general sense, a civilian-based, civilian-oriented policing by police departments. There has to be an equality of all before the law, including those public servants who carry arms. And there has to be a change in the psychology that the wealth of the citizenry is not an arbitrary and open spigot of plunder to take for yourself. Until that is done, no one is secure. Because you see, what, what asset forfeiture, you know, who do they steal from? White people, right? There, there are black, wealthy people involved that they suspect in drug dealing. But it's mostly white people. So this is, this is, this is a, a colorblind problem. Of, gov of police abusing in society. Now, the, the other element of this, if I can continue, Jacob, for a minute or two, is that the issue has been raised over and over again in these peaceful demonstrations and, and the heated anger and upsetness and vehemence with which uh, the participants sometimes express themselves to the media is that there's an underlying discrimination, an underlying prejudice, an underlying situation where blacks are kept in a position of, of, of being second-class citizens. Now, let me suggest that, that many blacks in the United States do have hurdles and barriers and restrictions that make the improvement of their lives better, uh, more difficult to make better than the average in many instances. But let me suggest, wearing my economist hat now, why is this the case? Why is this so difficult for people in, in, in a minority group, such as the African Americans, to rise up the ladder of success more rapidly or more pervasively? It has its origin in laws that were instituted decades and decades ago that had a racist content, con content to it. Minimum wage laws. Minimum wage laws were introduced and especially espoused in the southern states as a way to price out of the labor market black competitors who otherwise might have gotten jobs instead of white workers. That was part of the rationale originally for the minimum wage law, that to see that whites are guaranteed their jobs and blacks cannot compete. Now, does anyone think in those terms today, not even most unions, since unions have an integrated membership to a great extent, but you know there are unintended consequences and that law in the books, this minimum wage law, by itself inescapably prices the unskilled and the inexperienced and the high school dropout from being able to get a low paying job because his skills are low, but to have his foot on the bottom rung of that ladder of success to gain workplace experience, the skills and expertise and knowledge to either from that employer who has first hired him at the starting wage or some other as he becomes more experienced and see, see if he can get a better job, to get a higher pay looking down the future, to be able to save, to be able to open his own business. But will he be able to open his own business? Here you are with a modest income, very modest savings. You'd like to be self-employed. Now you have to deal with workplace regulation, licenses, certification, inspections, all of which raises the costs of starting a business, maintaining a business, and employing others as a small businessman 
who you would be giving opportunities which otherwise they might never be able to have. All of these things work against members of the African-American community in the United States. The, the famous economist Walter Williams wrote an excellent book focusing on many aspects of this years ago called The State Against Blacks, in which regardless of some intention 75 or 80, or 80 years ago, they, those policies, in effect, still have their unintended consequences today. So do we want an equality of opportunity? Yes. But the equality of opportunity means an equality of impartial rights before the law and the elimination of the regulations, the restrictions, the licensing, the prohibitions, higher cost of doing business that make it prohibitively difficult for people to rise up a ladder of success like many others have done in the society. That we have to establish, in other words, an open playing field of a free competitive market. That would do wonders to help ameliorate many of the prejudices, whether unintended or not, in, in their effects on members of the black community. And finally, I would just say, is that there has to be a change in mindsets. And what is that mindset? We have to practice what we have preached as a country for over 200 years. And that is, we view individuals, people as individuals with individual rights. And just as waves of immigrants came to America and we said, it doesn't matter where you came from or who you were then, what are you now in terms of your character, content of character, as the phrase goes, as an individual? And we as people have to start looking upon each other and asking ourselves just that. That is being made more difficult today and has been for decades because of affirmative action. It's not whether you're qualified to get a job or to be have entry into a college. What's your race? What's your gender? What's your ethnicity? What's your ancestral background? In other words, the reduction of all of us to categories of tribalism that has been reinforced with identity politics and political correctness today. We have to return to our individualistic philosophical roots, that it's individuals who exist, it is individuals who have rights. And as a matter of principle, as human beings, we should look upon and treat to the best of our ability our fellow human beings as individuals judged on that basis and rise above the tribalism that the American principles were supposed to get us beyond. All right. Let me, uh, let me address and reinforce some of the points you made. First of all, on the, uh, on the video you know, it, it's remarkable what, where, where the cop kills uh, George Floyd. I mean, it's remarkable looking at his face when the, the camera shows him looking up at the camera. It's this sort of malevolent indifference to what he's doing. Yes. I mean, there, there's yes. people there that are screaming, you're killing him, you're killing him. And it's just, it's just like this face of just malevolent indifference to what he's doing. Uh, all he had to do is release his knee a little bit. That's all he had to do. But, but there's another factor in this, Richard, and that's that big burly cop that's standing guard that lets him get away with this, that he's essentially telling the crowd, don't even think of coming to this guy's protection uh, because I will stop you. Not, and why he hasn't been charged as complicit in this murder is beyond me. I mean, because he's the guy, you know, one of the crowd, a guy in the crowd, or maybe a woman too, could have gone in there and just tackled the cop that was putting the knee down. But this great big guard there is essentially saying, you're not getting past me. And, and just the thought of that is just so shocking to me that this man is there saying, yeah, he may be killing him, but you ain't going to do anything about it. Right. And then... Um, your, your point about asset forfeiture is so good because they, they target oftentimes poor people, many of whom are black, on the highways, and uh, they'll lure them into just a casual question, you carrying anything with you, got any cash on you? Well, a lot of people deal with cash only, especially in the lower echelons of society. They're going to buy a used car, and they just, they're going to pay cash. They got seven or $8,000 in there, and and as soon as they say, yeah, we got this cash, the cop sees it without any evidence of a crime at all. They don't have to charge them with a crime. They can just say, we're taking your money because it's obvious that you're a drug dealer. 
and and never charge him with a crime. That's what's so phenomenal is how the courts have upheld this. I mean, you couldn't find a clearer case of of taking a property without due process of law. Now, of course, the person has a right to sue for it. The law says, well, you can sue for it if you if you object to this. But how many people at that lower echelon are able to hire a lawyer, especially when their $8,000 in cash has just been taken from them? And most lawyers are not going to take it on a contingency basis where they get a third of 8000 or so forth because there's so much time involved. So... The amount of money that they're stealing, and that's what it is, is just highway robbery, uh, where people are innocent, never charged with a crime, and they just have to forfeit the money as a practical matter. It, it's just, it boggles the mind. And then uh, your point about militarization of the cops is so good that, y you know, this is where foreign policy plays a role and the national security state. Uh, Keep in mind that, that America started out as a limited government republic with just a basic military force, and then it got converted into this giant national security state after World War II. Well, to put things into context, North Korea is a national security state, China is a national security state, China, uh, Cuba, Russia, Egypt, Pakistan, and post-World War II United States. Well, we, we know they're engaged in all these foreign wars and endless interventions and foreign military bases and well, they got to do something with the equipment. It gets outdated. And instead of simply destroying it, or if we'd had a limited government republic, it never would have come into existence, they start passing on their used equipment uh, to these police departments, which in encourages this mindset, this military mindset, that you, you, the citizenry is the enemy, the potential enemy. I mean, you see this one like in Iraq where the, the, the cops view the Iraqi people as, as enemies. It, 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 you never know who's, who's going to shoot at this foreign military invading, occupying army. Well, the, mind, the mindset then becomes that in, in, the, in the police departments. They start seeing themselves as the protectors of society, but they start seeing the people around them as potential enemies, and they use this military force. And uh, they, they use it to intimidate, to exercise dominion, power, control, the same thing way they do like in Egypt, uh, where, where the, the military and the, the police are essentially combined into one. Uh, but you know, with, with the militarization of the police, you've got this, this growing coalescence between the military and the police and the way they cooperate and the way they train and the way they think. And then your point about these economic regulations is so good. I mean, what, what we're really talking about is the new Jim Crow. Now, the, the noted academic, you mentioned Walter Williams. There's, there's a noted leftist academician named Michelle Alexander, um, who's fantastic when it comes to civil liberties and what the cop, cops are doing and the drug war. She calls the, the drug war the new Jim Crow. Well, what we recognize as libertarians is that this new Jim Crow goes far beyond just the drug war. I mean, like things like minimum wage laws and economic regulations. Many, t many of times, e if they're not intended to hold blacks down, that's their consequence. And everybody knows that that's their consequence. You mentioned minimum wage laws. Well, there's been this chronic unemployment rate among black teenagers for years of 30 to 40 percent. Why? Well, because in a market, People are going to value labor just like they value anything else. And if that labor of a black teenager is valued at less than the arbitrary minimum of $12 an hour or $15 an hour, he's not going to get employed. And so it protects the nice, well-to-do white kids uh, or white young people from the competition of blacks who would be willing to go to an employer and say, I'll do that same job that he's doing at $8 an hour to get my foot in the door, to learn a trade, to learn a business, learn how to treat customers so that maybe I can go out and start my own business. And that's another factor here of this Jim Crow, economic Jim Crow, is that with minimum wage laws, they lock out of the, of the market many people like in these inner cities, like African Americans, that would start businesses by hiring kids in the, in the neighborhood at, let's say, $5 an hour. Uh, where they would be competing against well-established businesses because they don't have a lot of capital, but if their labor costs are low, they're able to start up a business and, and uh, compete. Well, the minimum wage laws prevent those businesses from coming into existence, and it's sort of the libertarian economist Henry Hazlitt's point of this is one of the unseen consequences of, of government action. 
you don't see all the businesses that don't come into existence because of these really economic Jim Crow laws. Uh, and then, of course, you've got economic regulations that protect the well-established businesses. Uh, and it's all just a racket. It's a protection racket. Another Jim Crow aspect of this economically are licensing laws. These are designed to protect the well-to-do, like licensing laws in, in, in the legal profession, to protect against an inner-city African-American youth that, that educates himself, that goes and works for a lawyer as an apprentice, really becomes a fantastic lawyer, but he can't get that license because he didn't go to a government-approved uh, uh, law school. He, he can't become a lawyer as an apprentice like Abraham Lincoln did and other lawyers in the 19th century did before they, they had licensing laws. But it goes all across the spectrum. You've got uh, the, the medical profession, the same thing. You've got hairdressing profession, classic example where they, they lock blacks out of the labor market there because they have these enormously expensive requirements, educational requirements to get a license. Uh, it's all just a protection racket. So I would just say the final thing here, and this is uh, relevant as well, is that uh, in, in spite of all of the history of discrimination and prejudice, and in spite of all of the reasonableness of freedom of association, assembly, uh, and the need to greatly reform the types of things that you and I have spent uh, enumerating here today, this in no way, shape, or form justifies, rationalizes, or defends the looting, the plunder, the, uh, the violation of people's private properties, uh, the destruction uh, of, uh, of these, of these uh, storefronts. Let us keep in mind that these are businesses that cater to the very peoples in these communities. These are the businesses that supply the consumer goods, enable local people to be employed. Now, in some cases, as in New York and Manhattan uh, and Los Angeles, uh, the, 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 the luxury stores, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, or some of the upper scale stores in Manhattan uh, have been the ones plundered. Well, what's the difference with them? It is a difference. Because there are no human rights without property rights. What is the most fundamental property right? Our own persons, to be safe and secure in ourself. But we cannot live, we cannot prosper, we cannot express ourselves as human beings unless it is through the means, the external means of the property that our mental and physical labor, our collaborative productive activities with others generates. And if property is not secure, prosperity is not possible. And if prosperity cannot occur, then all of us cannot have the betterment under an equal rule of law. That should be the basis of a truly free and, 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 and moral society. No, excellent point. Let, let me wrap up my part by saying, you know, that this is, I think what's going on here, just a further manifestation is that there's something fundamentally wrong in American society and that it's time for Americans to do some real soul searching, especially in the midst of this coronavirus crisis, but now in the midst of this huge crisis over the killing of George Floyd, that this, this is the opportunity to start examining where we are as a country, where we came from, where the deviation took place. Because I think as people start examining what our founding principles were, the good ones, not the bad ones, and then realize that we deviated from those, I think they're going to start figuring out why there is so much dysfunctionality in American society. So on that note, Richard, we're out of time. Uh, enjoyed the conversation as always, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Until next time, I want to just thank our viewers and listeners for joining us again. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, and thanks for coming over to the Future of Freedom Foundation and visit, visit us, visiting us there. And, uh, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we look forward to seeing you all next week.